Good morning, everyone. So this is a little different, isn't it? So Connie, just take a minute, look out, take a couple deep breaths. They're not scary. They don't bite. They're all wearing masks. <laughs> everyone, this is my good friend, Connie McAllister. And some of you may have heard her testimony at camp meeting time. The conference did a video of it, but um, she is a very close friend of mine from our time out in Port Angeles. And in fact, the first time she shared her testimony was at the church there in Port Angeles, long before she was ever interviewed by the conference. And so I said to her, uh, Connie, would you come to the Forest Park Church and be willing to share your testimony there? And she said that she would. So we're going to do that this morning. Um, but real quick, let's bow our heads and invite God's presence here today. Dear Jesus, Lord, we know that this is your story. This is the story of your power, your glory, your complete and total defeat of Satan. And so, Lord, as Connie shares many aspects of her story, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here in this place that you touch those of us up front, give us the right words. Also, that you would touch each person prepared here to receive those words, that we would be encouraged, that we would know that you are still acting today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, to get, our, to get us started, um, you were in Tacoma area. And at the age of four years old, you experienced abuse from your stepfather, the type of inappropriate abuse that men sometimes do to little girls that can send them to prison. Yes. And that was um, a, a real part of your experience at that very young and tender age. Um, but could you tell us, because that would be a very traumatic thing for a young girl to experience, can you tell us what your stepfather did so that he wouldn't get caught doing this thing? Well, from the age of four. Um, Hold what it he, up a little closer. From the age of four, what he would give me is cocaine and heroin to keep me quiet. So um, uh, cocaine has been a part of my, had been a part of my life from the age of four. Yeah, unfortunately these microphones, you have to kind of eat them like an ice cream cone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You might have to remind me a time or two. So. Uh, that's all right. Okay. So from the age of four, yes. there is abuse, and then there is cocaine In and heroin. heroin given to you at the age of four mm -hmm. to keep you quiet. Yes. At the age of four. I just, mm. We have no idea what people are dealing with, friends. And sometimes completely unspeakable things happen. All right, now, what was your mother's profession? Could you tell us a little bit about uh, your mom? Well, she, <laughs> she had a few professions. Um, one, she ran a daycare with this person living in the home, and uh, she was a police officer, and uh, she was a child protective uh, agent as well. So this is all happening in a home that runs a daycare mm -hmm. by a lady who eventually became a police officer mm -hmm. and then finally became a child protective service agent. Yeah, we still can't figure that one out. We still can't figure yeah. that out. So um, would, it say that, would it be fair to say that Connie had an unfair uh, childhood? Um, nowadays they use a, a metric called adverse childhood experiences or they call it your ACE score. Yours would have been off the charts. Mm. Okay. Yours would have been off the charts. Well, so fast forward a little bit. You get to about the age 13, and more or less all these things have been constant up to this point. Is right. that accurate? Yes. So from the age 4 to 13, what we just described has been constant. Yeah. Drugs the entire time. Yes, cocaine. Cocaine. Heroin pretty much stopped. Heroin oh, stopped, no. but the cocaine was yeah, constant cost, all cocaine through the elementary though. years. Oh, yeah. Through school. And at 13, what did you do? Um, well, that's when I told my mom, you know, um, that my stepfather was molesting me. I always, you know, would see if I couldn't get the cocaine because I was addicted to it by then, that I would, I would use that 
um, that card to get him to continue to give me the drugs. Um, and when he didn't, I told her, and of course, um, well not of course, but she slapped me and said, how dare you lie about my husband? And we had um, some pretty um, adverse interactions since. She did was very physically abusive as well, so. And so did you stay in the home? No, I ran away. You ran away? Yeah, I ran away from home. How many times did you run away? Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, I ran away quite a few times. He kept sending me back, but I ran away quite a few times. Now, can anyone blame her for trying to run away? No, would you have done anything different under the circumstances? Probably not, probably not. Now, at, it was sometime right along in here, sometime age 13, 14, um, you got pregnant yes. with your son. Yes, my own. Now, that was not a, a desired or intentional act on your no. part. No, so you all can figure out how that happened but we're not gonna mention the, the specifics of that. But your son was born when you were age 15. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you ran away to Seattle and yes. ended up on the streets of Seattle. Yes. And as I understand, you fell in with some very bad people mm -hmm. who tried to force you to do some very bad things. Yes. And um, they ended up kidnapping you mm -hmm. and locking you in a closet. Yes for quite yeah. a while. Yeah, it seemed like it forever. It seemed, seemed like forever. <laughs> yeah. What happened to kind of resolve that situation? Well, the police came um, and they took me home, back home, and... Uh, Ice cream cone. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> and tears are okay too. Don't yeah. be afraid of those. <laughs> this is a hard part of the story for me. Mm. Uh, so when they took me home, I was pretty much skin and bones, but uh, uh, my mother read a bath for me, and she picked me up, and there was such love on her face and tears in her eyes, and it was the first time I felt that she loved me, so I still get emotional when I think about it or talk about it, mm. so. Mm. Yeah. The first time, and you're 15, 16-ish yeah. years old when this happens. Again, drugs was a constant throughout this entire oh, yeah. time. Oh, yeah. So exact timelines are a little bit indistinct. Right. But you are at the age when you could be getting a driver's license, and that's the first time you really experience mm. compassion like and love from your mother. Yeah. Yeah. Think about that just for a moment. Well, after that, um, especially due to the kidnapping, you developed um, agoraphobia. agoraphobia. Yeah. Now, for those who don't know what agoraphobia is, yeah. it is a complete, um, e even irrational fear of crowds or being out and around anyone. So those who are agoraphobic will tend to hide at home and go nowhere. nowhere. <laughs> and even the thought nowhere. of going out produces a panic attack. Yes. Um, how long did you uh, experience that agoraphobia? I'd say for about six months. I, I mean, just the fear of knowing that they were probably right outside the door to get me again um, uh, immobilized me. Uh, I couldn't be around anyone. But thank God, God has always been a part of my life. Amen. Even when um, I was going through what I was going through at a very young age, from the age of four, um, with my stepfather, I always, there was all this, always there was, there was a, a feeling of uh, a zone I could go to, you know, and it, and it was a, a comforting zone. And now I realize that that was God, you know, um, giving me a form of peace, you know, in these moments, so. Mm -hmm. All right, so you make it through your teenage years. Mm -hmm. All of these different things going on. Again, I, I'm going to emphasize this a few different times. Drugs have been a constant oh, all yeah. through here. Cocaine. Cocaine so. has been a constant all the way along. You manage to kind of work past the agoraphobia and yes. you go to college. Could by you the tell grace us of a God. <laughs> by the grace of God. Could you tell us a little bit about that college experience? Oh, my. Um, I, I um, got interested in sociology. And my sociology teacher 
um, amazing man. His name was Dr. Falk. Um, he, I, I did a, a paper on the kind of abuse I went through as a, as a young girl, and he kind of took me under his wing and um, taught me that men are okay, you know, and men can be a gentleman. And um, I was even invited to his home, and he was a gentleman and taught me um, the value of people and, and that your environment does not have to um, define who you are. So um, even after I, I left the college and you know, was doing other things and we lost contact with each other, every year my mom said up until I was 21 he would call and ask on my birthday, how's Connie? You know, um, so yeah, he, that was one of the mentors and angels, I believe, God Amen. brought into my Changing life. Changing your perspectives. God's just putting people in, mm -hmm. in your path yeah. to walk alongside you for a time to help yep. change your perspective. You know, that beginning of that healing process. That was. And I, I love the, the, the phrase that you used, our environment doesn't have to determine who we become. No, it doesn't. No, it does not. Our environment absolutely does not. Well, at this time, you had moved out of your mom's place and you were living on your own, mm -hmm. and you had some more children. Is yes. that correct? Could you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> uh, well, uh, Latasha and John came along. Their father, um, well, he did cocaine as well, um, so that was one of the reasons we were together. Um, and, the, and he introduced me to free base. Um, that's back in the Richard Pryor day. I don't know if anyone knows Richard Pryor and set his hair on fire. Um, uh, free basing, which is different than crack cocaine, but just slightly. Uh, but that was my introduction to that was with their father. Mm -hmm. And um, as this time kind of went on, you were, you were a pretty highly functioning addict. So oh, yeah. an addict, cocaine addict for sure. I was managing a restaurant. But you were, yeah, could you tell us about that? Yeah, <laughs> working many hours managing a restaurant. Yeah, um, I, I, would, I felt that I was functioning, highly functional because of the cocaine, you know, um, especially when I was a realtor. Mm -hmm. um, it was Century 21 for six plus years, I believe it was. Um, it came in very handy then. Yeah, so for six years, so you managed a restaurant, you worked you know, many hours working in the restaurant industry, and then you transitioned from working in the restaurant in industry to real estate. Mm -hmm. And you worked with Century 21, you became a realtor, yes. and uh, another man entered your life at that time. Robert McAllister. Robert McAllister. Yes. Yes, indeed. Could you tell us about Robert? Oh, awesome man. Um, but he also supplied my cocaine habit. <laughs> mm. So uh, uh, he never did cocaine, didn't smoke, um, drink every now and then. Um, he was a very good man. Actually, when, when I was with him was when I started using crack cocaine. And once I started using that, things spiraled out of, out of control so quick, so amazingly quick. Um, I remember once he had said that uh, it, just in a year he had counted a hundred thousand um, dollars was used just that he kept track of, you know, for cocaine. Um, quite a few people knew me in Tacoma. I, I wasn't doing all that myself, but quite a few people were um, uh, doing that. And I had family that were Crips and Bloods and whatnot, so, um, yeah. So you had this kind of semblance of a normal life on the outside. Oh, yeah. you, um, you and Robert got married? Yes. So you got married and he took your children in as his own. Yes, he um, did. And you worked together in the real estate industry and uh, on the outside life appeared to be good, mm -hmm. but the cocaine habit just kind of kept steadily getting worse. Oh, yeah. And as you said, that it was during that time that you tried crack cocaine. Yes. Which um, we, we don't necessarily need to give a, a street level education about the differences <laughs> right. um, here, right. but it's a much more powerful and potent way of ingesting cocaine. Okay. Mm -hmm. And 
that uh, flipped something in you. You were no okay. longer just this high-functioning addict who could manage all these other things. I was completely dysfunctional. You were completely dysfunctional. So things switched from being high-functioning to totally dysfunctional. And um, you said it took a year or less for the crack cocaine habit to just spiral out of control. When you kind of hit the bottom of that spiral, at least within your family, uh, how did, what happened at kind of the end of that uh, year? Uh, well, that's when I went to the store. And, well, I told them I was going to the store and I left. And they didn't see me again for at least a year or two, maybe. Um, I, I was tired of um, sucking my family up. You know, I didn't want to continue to be one of those people that caused so much heartache and pain um, and devastation to my family, so um, I decided to leave. And Robert, you know, he, 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 made, he wasn't the father of my children, but he took care of them. Um, matter of fact, my daughter graduated valedictorian um, because he made sure that they still got a good education and had a good home. And Praise God for that. Even though I left and was not there. Praise God for that. So this is approximately 1990 mm -hmm. or so. Now you've already mentioned that you had family who were part of the Crips and the Bloods. And for mm -hmm. those who don't know, those, those are gangs. And all up, along, up and down the West Coast, um, those gangs exist and they do exist in the Tacoma area for sure. Yeah. So where did you go when you left home? You went out to the store to get, as you told me, some milk and eggs and never, yeah, came, back. never came back. Where did you go? Hilltop Tacoma. Hilltop Tacoma. Yeah. Hilltop Tacoma. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Hilltop Tacoma. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's a few who are familiar in this room with Hilltop okay. Tacoma. Yeah. But you went there, and um, basically what, what you told me is that for the next approximately 20 years. Yes. Now, let's think about this now. Yep. For approximately the next 20 years there on Hilltop Tacoma, you did whatever you needed to do yes. to feed your cocaine habit. Yep. Yes. That includes, but is not limited to, dealing. Selling drugs. Selling yeah. drugs. Yeah. Managing That's, others who are selling drugs. Oh, absolutely. Got to keep that revenue coming in for the product to come mm -hmm. in. So. Yeah, all the while. Okay, and then some other things started happening uh, during this time. You started to develop, uh, or compete in a race that you didn't know that you were competing in for the most arrests <laughs> by the Tacoma Police Department. Um, could you yeah. tell us a little bit about uh, you know, your arrest record and uh, criminal <laughs> life during this time? I wasn't a good criminal. At all. <laughs> I was not a good criminal. Um, I got arrested quite a bit. Um, matter of fact, it was, it was a real snowy, a cold night. Um, had woke up in the snow and even asked an officer to arrest me. I told him, I have a warrant for my arrest. Please arrest me because it was so cold out. Um, but once I was in jail, uh, I was with one of the officers. And she said, you know what? There's only one other person who's been arrested more than you, and they have been arrested over a hundred times. So, yeah, I wasn't, that, I wasn't that, very good. And that's in Tacoma, yeah. and yeah. many may not know that just across the Tacoma Narrows Bridge up in the Gig Harbor area is it's, the women's um, penitentiary, Washington State Penitentiary, called Purdy. Purdy. And yeah. that's where felons go. So the difference, uh, a misdemeanor, you know, is less than a year's worth of punishment, and you stay local for that uh, incarceration, and a felony is over a year, and you would go to prison for that. And so you were sent across the bridge quite a few times, is that yes. right? I did a total of six years at Purdy. Um, but yes, I, I, have, I have multiple felonies. I have, ooh, I'm trying to think, it's over 50, 40 something. 50, over 60, 50. Yeah, felonies. And, and that's I'm, just and felonies. Still, yeah, that's not even including the misdemeanors. That's not all the that, misdemeanors. That Remember, the misdemeanor the is less than a year, and the felony is greater than a year. Shouldn't you still be in prison now? I should be. <laughs> uh, I, I should still be in prison. 
should still but, be there. Uh, I wish I would have brought the book. Yeah, so there's a book. Yeah. She has a book. Um, it's a three-ring binder <laughs> that catalogs all of the felonies. And that I, I forgot to ask her to bring it, and she yeah. was already mostly the way over here from Port Angeles when I remembered. But it's a pretty thick binder that catalogs all of the different felony convictions um, that you have. And so it's a testament to what God can do. Absolutely. The fact that you're not in prison right now. Now, um, were you able to get sober while you were in prison? No. <laughs> no. Prison, um, you can do just as much drugs in prison as you do on the streets. Uh, and the guards bring in the best, the best drugs. You know, so, yeah. The guards bring in the best drugs. So, still, all this time, you more or less haven't experienced sobriety. No. 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 Connie does not know what it means to not have cocaine in her system. No. No, my brain, yeah. In Didn't jail, that meant. in jail or out of jail, Connie's Still been high. Cocaine. Yeah. All right, so that's an important part, and we mentioned Purdy for a reason because that'll come up in just a minute. Mm -hmm. But um, in around the year 2008, now you've been approximately 1990 to about 2008. You've been Hilltop Tacoma. You've been in the gang life. You've been in the drug running scene. You've been in and out of mm -hmm. prison this whole time, and you've been high the whole time. And oh, yeah. now, would anyone, is anyone, knowing the background for Connie and for her story, surprised by how her life is turning out? I don't think we should be. Um, it, given what happened to her as a very young child, that's not surprising even in the least. Mm -hmm. But you came out to a little town on the Olympic <laughs> Peninsula called Port Angeles. Yes. Why did you come to Port Angeles? Well, the last time I got out of prison, October 14th, 2008, um, there was a guy who... Um, I used to get drugs for, you know, and he would come looking for me um, in Tacoma so that he could take drugs back to Port Angeles to have something um, there. Anyhow, he came and found me uh, a couple of days after I'd gotten out of prison. Um, and he said, you know, why don't you come to my place for the weekend and just get away from things for a while because, you know, just because... I'm a pretty mellow person, you know, and I like being out in, in, in nature. But um, I said, okay, why don't you go home? You know I don't like you. Think about it, and if you think you can be around me and I can be around you for the weekend, then sure, I'll go. So we went home and came back, got some more drugs, and said, yeah, come on for the weekend. And I've been there ever since. <laughs> Been there ever since. Now, your original reason for coming out to Port Angeles was to deal drugs. It was to sell drugs. Sell yeah. drugs. So she comes to this new, very small town and is setting up shop. Mm -hmm. Now, you had some interesting clients who came to buy drugs from you <laughs> in Port Angeles. Could you tell us just a little bit about them? Yes. Um, I remember uh, the, the, the one gentleman, I won't say his name, who came and... You know, he's kind of high strung. But one thing he believed in is that, you know, no matter what you're doing, God sees you. And he had no problem talking about God or the Bible. And, um, and he's, you know, we, and I agree, you know, no matter what you're doing, God sees what you're doing. You can't hide from him, no matter what. And so he said, well, there's this book called Steps to Christ um, that you should read. And I'm like, Okay, because our conversation was real, real intriguing. And so he left the book with me, took his drugs, and he left. And mm. so I started reading it that night. All right, let's pause right there because there's a couple okay. points I want to get before <laughs> we get to that point because that's, okay. the, that's the punchline of the whole story. Um, what, mem or what church was this gentleman a member of? The Seventh-day Adventist Church. This, I did not know that, though. She didn't know that. What would you have thought if you had known he was a Seventh-day Adventist at the time? Oh, I would not have touched it with a 10-foot pole. You wouldn't have? I thought the Adventists were a cult and <laughs> Koresh and, mm. you know, um, yeah. Yeah, Adventists were a cult, wouldn't have had anything to no. do with this guy. But um, let's not skip over the fact that it was a Seventh-day Adventist church member who was feeding his own cocaine habit mm -hmm. and came to buy drugs from you. And then he shared steps to Christ with you. Yes. Think about that for just a moment. The circumstances that God can use. <laughs> a Seventh-day Adventist church member with a cocaine habit. Now, if you are 
a member like that, I have no idea. This was obviously something done in secret from the okay. members of the church community. But there's help available if that is you. Um, don't be afraid to uh, seek help if that is yes. you. Uh, but, okay, you were given the book Steps to Christ. Mm -hmm. You were intrigued by this conversation. And then what happened? Well, I started reading it. Like you I started reading night. it. Okay, so and that's I the first point. It. You got to start reading it. <laughs> yeah. That's important. And I kept reading. And the next day I was reading it. And the next day I'm reading it. And I'm thinking, this woman, she gets it. You know, she, she knows what she's talking about. This is what I've always believed God would, would say or be like. I, and I thought, whoever this Ellen White woman is, I'd like to know <laughs> more about her and her, her writings. But after a few days, I realized I wasn't getting high. And which... <laughs> which amazed me. So I kept reading the book. <laughs> and uh, so my uh, friend who brought me to his place didn't have a live-in drug dealer anymore <laughs> once I started. So a Seventh-day Adventist church member feeding his own cocaine habit comes to buy drugs from you, gives mm -hmm. you steps to Christ, you start reading Steps to Christ, yeah. and you keep reading Steps to Christ, oh, yeah. and you keep reading Steps to Christ, and about four or five days later, you realize you haven't been getting high for the first time in your life. Right, for the first time, by choice. Can we get an amen? <laughs> reading the book Steps to Christ that was so breaks your cocaine addiction. Obviously, it's not the book. It's the it's God who God, is behind yeah. the book. He meant for me to read that book. And not only does he break the addiction, but he takes away the desire for the cocaine. Is that right? To this day, I have no desire. I have never had a desire. Amen. Yes, a round of applause is appropriate. <laughs> All right. And so then you start eventually attending the Seventh-day Adventist Church and become a part of that community, although it, it took a while for you to become a member. We'll talk about that in, in a okay. few minutes. Yeah. But you started, you know, obviously your life changed trajectory completely at this point. Yeah, God had a different plan. God had a totally different plan. Could you talk a little bit about some of the ministry that you were able to get involved in after God totally changed the direction of your life? Well, prison ministries was the first one that I got involved in. I always said I'd be back, though, <laughs> whenever I left. <laughs> uh, quite a few people were surprised <laughs> in the way I came back. Um, so. And are there any particular stories of things that God has done through your involvement in prison ministries Absolutely. at at the Purdy Prison there in the Gig Harbor area? In yes. fact, I was. A, a, a tiny bit annoyed a couple of times out there in Port Angeles because I wanted to get to know Connie better. Hey, Connie, you want to come over for lunch on Sabbath after church? Nope, I got to go. And church was out or maybe not even church was out and she'd get up and she'd get in the car and she was gone because you were going to Purdy and from Port yep. Angeles to Gig Harbor is about an hour and a half long drive. Right. But can you tell us any stories of what God has done through your time um, as a prison minister in Purdy? <laughs> there you go. Um, well, um, what, touches, what touched me the most was there was a female, we did a lot of dirt in prison together, um, uh, and we, whenever I was in prison, we were t together in prison, we, we, we did a lot of things we shouldn't have been doing, and so uh, when she saw me um, come to, um, to the, the prison with the Adventist church, I need to look this way. <laughs> Uh, she was surprised and thought, if God can change me, he can change anyone. So she got baptized. Praise Jesus. And is now a member of the church as well in prison. Um, so, and then others became baptized as well as Adventists in the prison. Um, but that fuels me. It keeps me encouraged. You know? Amen. And you also helped out at the Salvation Army, is that correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was there for quite a few years, eight years, I think, eight, nine years. 
Um, I like being close to people on the streets. You know, I, I still like to be a part of that community to uh, give back. And especially since I know how it feels to be out there on the streets. Um, and the different things I've experienced in my life, I can usually relate to something with someone and uh, just try to be encouraging and encouragement mm, to and others. If I recall correctly, at the Salvation Army, they put you at the front window oh, yeah. because <laughs> not only can you be an encouragement, but you also knew when people were up to no good. Oh, yeah, and I put a stop. Yeah, that. so was, she could put yeah, a stop to that was, in a more effective way than many others could. Yeah, they have and, there. In fact, uh, in my time as the chaplain with the police department out there, I um, ended up at the Salvation Army quite a few different times, and uh, I'd ask the, the majors there at the Salvation Army, oh, do you know Connie? Oh, we love Connie. She's wonderful. <laughs> Tell her to come back. And, <laughs> uh, and, and even some of the people there call me Mama Bear, but yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. Well, it was along in this time, um, I moved out to Port Angeles in 2015, and we got to know each other. Yes. And your journey toward becoming officially a Seventh-day Adventist member happened. And I, I think there were some things you wanted to mention yes, about that. Yes, I do, because if, <laughs> if you had not um, been so encouraging to do the Bible studies with me, I mean, I'd learned some things throughout the years, but it was bits and pieces scattered. And you just kind of took me under your wing and you know, another mentor in my life. Okay, <laughs> took me under his wing and answered so many other questions in life that I had outside of church stuff, um, but God's stuff, because God's a part of everything. Um, and uh, because of that study with you, I'm a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church Praise as Jesus. well. I believe we have so, a picture that we're going to put up on the, oh. from the day Connie joined. There we go. There you are, Connie. Oh, Connie yeah. joined the church by profession of faith. She didn't know that picture was coming. That's a surprise <laughs> to her right now. Yeah. But that was our little commissioning service like yes. we like to do for our new members and commissioning you into ministry um, as a new member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so that was in 2008, I believe, or 2018, rather, um, of October 2018. Um, from the time she heard about the Adventist Church, 2008, to the time she became a member was about 10 years. Now, some of us, when we're working with people who are prospective members, pre-Adventists, we get a little discouraged if we don't see results in the first three to six months. We want people to be microwaved. <laughs> um, I would argue that the slow cooking method is probably much more effective <laughs> and produces a better result. So we need to not be in a hurry when it comes to raising new members because um, I've baptized and done profession of faith for quite a few different people over the mm -hmm. years, and very, very few of them can claim that they've gone into prison and baptisms have resulted from the testimony and the ministry that they have done. So the slow-cooked method is a very, yes, very beautiful is. one. And just a tiny bit of context as well for part of the reason it took a long time. Mm -hmm. um, the Port Angeles Church was uh, involved in some theological controversy that the church ended up splitting over. And Connie, being a brand new Christian, brand new Adventist, even though you weren't officially a member at that point, was kind of plopped right into the middle of, and that created a lot of confusion for you, it uh, did. especially in a theological sense. And but, so, but I thought if Satan's working this hard, it must be the right church. Ah, uh, if Satan is working this hard, it must be the right <laughs> church. Yeah, that's another round of applause right there. <laughs> All right. Well, you are now officially a Seventh-day Adventist member. Can you talk a little bit about the ministry that you are doing right now? Well, right now, um, six, well, seven nights, well, at least six nights a week, we go out and feed the homeless and make sure that they have clothing and, you know, socks, you know, and um, pass out Steps to Christ. If they would want one or pamphlets, we always have our prayer book with us for anyone who wants to pray. Um, we also have a doctor involved with uh, this ministry who comes out once a week with us now um, so that if anyone needs any kind of medical help or services, there's someone there for that as well, for pe those people who won't go to a hospital or, or get any help. Um, um, and, and we have an awesome pastor. Uh, as well, so Pastor in, Jay in Kuhn out there Jay in Port Kuhn, Angeles. Yes, he was the pastor who baptized me, and he followed me to Port Angeles. <laughs> and now he's working with me. <laughs> and now he's working with you. Yeah. So yes. We still. It, 
It is truly incredible what God can do through someone's life. So I'm going to just uh, re, uh, revisit a couple of the high points along the line of your journey. But you were abused as a young child. You were given drugs that gave you a, a deeply entrenched cocaine habit okay. that lasted from the age four till 40-something? 50? 50-something. Now... You should be dead, probably. Oh, many times You should over. be dead, probably. <laughs> um, or still in prison. Mm -hmm. And yet here you are. And our verse today, Psalm 106, verse 8, and I didn't memorize it, but um, it says, God, mighty God, saved for the sake of his name. And to, just to prove that he is God, yes. he saves. Yes, he does. And that verse really resonated with me when thinking about your story and how... God just brought another cocaine addict into your path, but delivered steps to Christ because he had another plan. <laughs> now, some of you may be wondering, and I know most of you here probably know about the book Steps to Christ. You probably have your own copy, and that is wonderful, but we have 10 of them up here. Um, and after the service, Connie's going to be down here in front, mm -hmm. and if you do not have a copy of the book Steps to Christ and you would want one, Come forward, and Connie will be happy to share one with you and give you one. If you would like to converse with her a little bit about her story, again, she'll be right up here in front and available to chat just a little bit. Yes. Um, and I finally get to invite her over for lunch today. She's not running off and away, so <laughs> she's like going to come to our run. house uh, for lunch. Yeah. But, Connie, thank you so much for coming oh, here Pastor. to Forest Park and being willing to share your story about not only how tragic and treacherous life can be, yes. but also that we have a God who is truly capable of saving people. Completely. Our God is mighty yes. to save. We, have, we serve a mighty, mighty God. Thank you for inviting me. You are welcome. And thank you all for having me here. <laughs> thank you so much. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what an incredible story and testimony. I don't really have words except to sit here in awe of your power. Everything in our experience tells us that someone who has dealt with what Connie has dealt with could have a mediocre life at the very best that addiction would always be a major, major component in the constant fight and struggle, and that the trauma of the abuse would be ever-present. And yet here, Jesus, we can see that you are bigger than that, that you are more capable than Satan. Your ability to save is more powerful than Satan's ability to harm. Amen. Amen. And so, dear Jesus, May we be encouraged by the story, by the testimony of what you have done in Connie's life, knowing that there's nothing that you can't deal with in our own lives. Yes. Yes. Looking to Jesus and to the cross, we put our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Have you worship with us at this address, 